from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm now welcoming you officially to the Library of Congress. This program is sponsored by the Center for the Book and the Young Reader Center. I'm Karen Jaffe, and I'm head of the Young Reader Center. If any of you who are in the room right now have ever been to the Library of Congress before, raise your hand. Anybody? Great. And if you have it, if this is your first time at the Library of Congress, we hope you'll come back. We hope you'll visit us at the Young Reader Center in the Jefferson Building, which is across the street. Maybe you'll come with a class. Maybe you'll come with your family. We hope you do. Before I start, I want to get a shout out from the schools that are here. So when I call your name, if you could please raise your hands and let us know who you are. You can clap if you want. From Washington, D.C., Brent Elementary. Okay, from Washington, D.C., St. Peter's School. From Washington, D.C., Hyde Adams Elementary. From Washington, D.C., Truesdale Education Center. Yay. And from Virginia, from Virginia, the Langley School. Okay. We're all here because of one of the most popular children's authors in the world, and we know that. And he's come to visit you today. And I'm not kidding when I say that Jeff Kinney is the most popular children's author in the world because according to a recent issue of Publishers Weekly, The Diary of a Wimpy Kid, The Long Haul, which is the ninth book in this series, is number one worldwide. So, before we start, I know you're anxious and excited, but I just have to give you a few rules about the rest of, of the morning, afternoon. So here we are. Um, Jeff is going to conduct the program for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have uh, about 10 to 20 minutes for questions. This is how the questions will work. We have two microphones on either side of the aisle that's separating you. If you have a question when it's time, and that's at the end of the program, you'll raise your hand so Jeff can call on you, and you will wait for a microphone to be handed to you. After your question is answered, please put the mic back to the person so we can go on to the next. Also at the end of the program, there will be a group photo with Jeff Kinney. If everyone is quiet and follows the directions of the photographer. So when we're time to do that at the end, I will announce it and you will follow the directions of the photographer. So now, it's my sincere pleasure to welcome the author of Wimpy, The Wimpy Kid, The Diary of a Wimpy Kid, Long Haul, Jeff Kinney. Hey guys, how are you doing? How are you guys doing today? Can you hear me? Sort of? All right, I'll bring this. Can I bring this a little closer? Here we go. How are you guys doing? I've never gotten welcomed so warmly before. And I think it's because I'm home. I grew up around here. I grew up across the river in Washington, in, in Fort Washington, Maryland. Okay? So it's been a long journey for me to become an author. And I thought, what it, would be do, what it would be good to do is to tell you my story because it's been quite a journey and now I'm sort of back home. So it actually started 
for me, with a love of cartoons. I need to change something here. Hold on one sec. It started with me, for me, with a love of cartoons, is that my father, when he was a kid, in the 1950s and 60s, he collected comic books, right? He collected comic books, and then when he got older, he went away to the Naval Academy, and his parents actually threw out all his comics. It was kind of sad, because they thought, once he became a grown man, he wouldn't want to read comics anymore. So when he had kids, you know, he started raising our family in Fort Washington, Maryland, he decided to recollect all the comics that he had read as a child. So some of his favorite comics were like this one, uh, Donald Duck. And every morning, my dad would read the Washington Post, and he'd open up the comics section to the comics page. So when I came down, I would look at the comics page, and I'd find a comic like Calvin and Hobbes, which sounds like you guys know Calvin and Hobbes. The Far Side was another big favorite, all right? And so when I went off to college, when I went to the University of Maryland, I created my own uh, cartoon character, and his name was Igdoof, right? And Igdoof is kind of a funny name. He was a very odd-looking character. He was very short. He had a huge nose, big ears, bug eyes, and he had very little hair on his head, right? When I started studying the history of cartoons and comics, I found out that there's a long history of boy characters, boy cartoon characters in comics, who are bald or nearly bald, right? Including the very first cartoon character whose name was the Yellow Kid. And the Yellow Kid is this freaky looking guy, right? You wouldn't want to see him uh, under your bed at night, right? And there have been all these other boy cartoon characters who were nearly bald, including the most famous of all, Charlie Brown. <laughs> You guys know Charlie Brown, very cool. He's kind of strange looking, he's bald, but he's got this little squiggle of hair on his forehead. And I think that the reason that cartoonists make that choice uh, to have their boy cartoon characters be bald is they want to make sure you know who the main character is. If you look at all the other Peanuts characters, they look pretty normal, right? And then Charlie Brown stands out a little bit. And that's why I drew Igdoof the way that I did. In 1989, while I was still in high school, a new comic came out in the paper about a boy who had a little more hair on his head, and his name was Big Nate. <clears throat> and I really like this comic. I really like Big Nate because it was about childhood. You know, it wasn't, uh, you know, a lot of comics are about kids, but they're really acting like adults. But this was a comic about kids who were acting like kids, so I really liked it. So I wrote to the creator, Lincoln Purse, and I said, hey, you know, what do you think of my strips? What do you think of Igdoof? So I wrote him something called a letter. Have you guys heard of a letter? <laughs> yes, a letter. For those of you who don't know, it's a piece of paper. You write on, you fold it up, right? You put it in an envelope, right? And then you put a stamp on it. You've heard of this. You've heard of this. And he wrote me back which was really, really cool. You know, to get a letter back from somebody who I really admired was really pretty awesome. And I was really looking for praise from Lincoln. I was hoping he would say, boy, your comics are great, Igdu's great. You know, you don't need to change a thing. And instead he told me all the things I was doing wrong. So here you can see he was telling me I needed to give my words more space, which, I, which was actually a good piece of advice. Um, so I got really kind of excited about this, and a few years into my friendship with Lincoln by, through letters, uh, my brother called me up and he said, Jeff, you've got to look at today's Washington Post. Look at Big Nate. So I did. Here's what I saw. And I knew right away it was one of the days where Big Nate draws himself in the comic, so it looks like it was created by a kid. And then I looked very closely in one of the frames, and I could see that Big Nate was holding a piece of paper with stickers on it. And the stickers had three cartoon characters. I'm sure you recognize them. There's Bart Simpson, Garfield, and Igdoof, right? So this was a huge moment in my life. You know, Igdoof was only really one centimeter on the page, but it meant the world to me because now my cartoon character, Igdoof, was in the Washington Post, my paper. And I felt like a real published cartoonist, and I felt like I was on my way. So I worked on my comic for a few more years and got better at it. And then I was really surprised when the Washington Post decided to do a big feature on Igdoof, me and Igdoof, on their style page. Uh, so it was really, really cool for me. And they told me that Igdoof was on his way. You know, he was going to be the next big thing 
in comics. Of course, I was very excited about that. that. You can see how, how happy I look with myself right there. <laughs> so I graduated, I graduated from Maryland with a degree in criminal justice, of all things. And then I went off into my career, and I tried to become a newspaper cartoonist. And I put together a submission packet. And this was my way of selling my comics in to the syndicates, and they're the ones who get the comics into newspapers, right? So you need to get past the syndicates. <clears throat> and so here is my, my submission packet. I included all my very best strips. I sent it off. I waited for a little while. And a few weeks later, I got back lots of these, right? This is a rejection letter. There are lots of words on it, but the only word that matters is the word no, right? <laughs> they weren't interested in syndicating my Igdoof comic strip, so it was very disappointing. And worse than that, you can see on the page it says, Dear Creator, right? It doesn't say Dear Jeff. It doesn't mention Igdoof anywhere. And the letter doesn't tell me what I could be doing better. You know, so there was nothing to build on. It was not very, it wasn't kind of positive feedback or constructive criticism. There's nothing I could really do with this other than to just put together another submission packet, send it out again, and get rejected again. So it was really a tough few years trying to get syndicated. In the meantime, I had to get a job, right? So my first job out of college was actually as a, uh, as a newspaper designer. I did graphics. I wrote headlines for a newspaper. It wasn't cartooning, but at least I was close to newspapers. But I couldn't make enough money to support myself. And so eventually, I became a computer programmer at a medical software company, which sounds a little strange uh, for somebody who wants to be a cartoonist. And then eventually, I got into writing games for kids, online games for kids, at a website called FunBrain. <laughs> sounds like you know FunBrain, which is pretty cool. So I was getting a little bit closer. You can see that those are some of my cartoon characters that I created for the games. And eventually, this one day, I was mowing my lawn in my new home of Plainville, Massachusetts, and I kind of stopped because I had this idea. I had this idea where you could create an avatar and go on quests and collect items, and that's where the idea for a website called Pop Tropica came from. Cool, you played that, excellent. So Pop Tropica became my full-time job, and in fact, it's still my job to this day. And I'm pretty sure my boss right now is wondering where I am because I'm not at work. <laughs> but this is what I do. I actually do my writing for Wimpy Kid on the side. So this is what I do in my sort of nine to five day. And eventually, during my professional career, I came to realize I wasn't going to make it as a cartoonist, as a newspaper cartoonist. There were two reasons for this. One is that newspapers were shrinking. Most major cities used to have two or even three big newspapers. And now most major cities have about one. So I knew that my opportunities were at least cut in half. And the other much bigger reason was that I realized that I just couldn't draw well enough. If I looked at all of the other comics on the page, I could see that everybody else had a technique and style that was so much more sophisticated than mine. And I couldn't seem to get there. I couldn't seem to get my drawings just right. So I had this idea. I had an idea. I said, you know what? I'm going to give up on newspaper cartooning. Uh, but I still want to be a cartoonist. But I'm going to actually draw as a kid. I'm going to pretend I'm a kid and do it that way. So that's when the idea for Diary of a Wimpy Kid hit me in 1998. And I started writing down ideas. I started collecting ideas that would form the stories in Diary of a Wimpy Kid. What I did was I tried to remember everything funny that had happened to me as a kid, which I'd really recommend to you guys now is to start writing down the funny things that are happening to you because that's gold later on. I had to spend a long time trying to remember what it was like to be a kid. And so here are some of the ideas uh, that eventually made their way into my books. Right in the middle, if you go up a little bit from the middle, you'll see a picture of some teenagers at a party. It's kind of a sloppy picture. It's hard to tell exactly what's going on. But that, you guys see it. That's cool. But that ended up being the idea that Roderick's friends accidentally take a picture of Roderick's party, which was both in the second book and it was in the second movie. So in the lower right hand, if you look in the middle on the right hand side, you'll see Roderick feeding Greg a plate of cold spaghetti, right? And he did that because, and you, yeah, you have the book, right? So 
Roderick gives him a play of cold spaghetti that, that Greg actually thinks is heated, right? He thinks he's microwaved it. So Greg takes a bite of a meatball that he's expecting it to be hot, and it's ice cold. And I actually did that to my younger brother, so I was a Roderick to my younger brother. So you can see I was collecting ideas, funny things that had happened to me, to my parents, to my friends, all in one place. And as I went on, I started writing smaller and smaller. I think I was worried that I was going to fill up that sketchbook too quickly. So I started writing smaller and smaller. And it took a lot of time because I was running out of ideas. It was hard to keep thinking of all the things that had happened to me as a kid. But eventually I finished the book uh, with my last page, right, which was this one. And as you can see, it got a little crazy there. You know, I was writing tiny, almost microscopically. Uh, and by the end, that one page took four months. It took me four whole years to fill out that sketchbook. And then it took me another four years to write the first draft of Diary of a Wimpy Kid, which was 1,300 pages long. And the funny thing is, I threw out 90% of everything I wrote in this sketchbook. So I decided that only 10% of the material in the sketchbook was usable. So when I was finished with my first draft, I printed out just 12 pages, right? just 12 pages, just a small sample. And I brought those pages to something called New York Comic Con. And this is what Comic Con looks like. You guys, sounds like some of you have heard of New York Comic Con. New York Comic Con is a place where people go to gather who love comics, who love superhero comics and newspaper comics. They dress up, they all come together at Comic-Con. And I knew there would be publishers there. And I figured I'd walk my sample packet around and I'd ask people if they would like to read this thing that I was working on. So I'd walk up to a booth and I'd say, hey, would you like to see this, this thing? I've been working on it for eight years. You know? And they said, you know, no, this isn't really the right place for that kind of a thing. And so I was getting really discouraged. Uh, discouraged. And on my way out, I ran to this guy named Charlie and he was an editor at a publisher called Abrams. And I said, hey, would you like to see this thing I've been working on? And he said, sure, I'll take a look. And he took a look just at the first page of Diary of a Wimpy Kid. He didn't read a word of it. Right? He just looked at it. And he said, this is exactly what we're looking for. So after three years of, of failing to get my cartoon syndicated for newspapers, and then eight years of working on my first draft, I had this moment that turned my life upside down. And it's really been turned upside down ever since. And I hope it never gets turned right side up because it's just too much fun. So now, fast forward all these years later, there are eight Wimpy Kid books. In fact, there's nine as of the other day. The new book just came out. So it's been very exciting to be a children's author instead of a newspaper cartoonist. And now, when I write a new book, I actually have to start from scratch. Right? I, I've used up all of the ideas, all of the good ideas in that sketchbook. So now when I write a new book, I have to start with a blank slate. And it always starts for me in January. Now I live in a town, like I mentioned, called Plainville, Massachusetts. This is what it looks like in January. And if I recall correctly, this is what it looks like in January around here too, right? In February also, maybe a little bit of March. So this is when I start my book. And I know to write a good book, I need 350 ideas. Because if I come up with 350 ideas, I can throw out the bad ones and I'll be left with just the good ones. And so what I've done is have had, had these wood blocks painted, these wood panels, right? Painted with numbers on them. And you can see my office inside of there, right? And every day when I go into my office, I know how many jokes I have. Every time I get a new joke, I trade out the numbers, right? I trade the numbers out and increment, increase the counter. Um, so it's actually nice to have something that I can touch. Those pieces of wood are something I can touch and feel because as adults, almost all the work we do is digital, right? It's always on screens. So it's nice to actually have something that really represents the jokes that I'm writing. So I have to count from zero all the way up to 350, and then I can start writing my book. Now I'm going to show you an action shot of what it looks like when I'm writing one of my books because it's very exciting, and I'm sure you will be very, very impressed. So this is what it looks like. <laughs> All right. I knew you'd be impressed. This is me sitting and waiting. I actually have no idea how to come up with a new idea for Diary of a Wimpy Kid. It's mostly I just have to sit there and wait around. Um, and so I bought this video game rocker. You see my dog thundered it there by the floor, right? He's a Portuguese water dog. And we sit there and we wait. And I'm sure he's thinking, what is this guy doing? 
And it's really boring. It's actually really boring sitting there and waiting. Sometimes I'll sit there for four hours and I won't come up with any jokes at all. And then eventually this happens, right? And I know it's time to quit for the day. <laughs> I've written almost all of the ideas for the Diary of Wimpy Kid books on my dog's couch, right? It's this dirty couch that we eventually had to throw away because it got so gross, right? And I'm one, I was one of those kids in school who had trouble paying attention to teachers. Uh, I get distracted very easily, right? So, yeah, I know some of you have that problem, right? That happened to me a lot, right? And so what I do is when I write, it's very boring for me. It's very difficult for me. And so I need to block out the distractions around me. So I will actually put a blanket over my head like this, right? And it's really hard to conv convince my family members that I'm working, right? They come in the room. Maybe my wife asked me to take out the trash, for example. And I'll have to tell her, can't you see that I'm working, right? So this year, I had to get away. It was a tough winter, lots and lots of snow. And I said to my family, I said, this is going to be really weird. But I'm going to go away on vacation by myself, right? I'm going to go to Puerto Rico. Some people have been there. So this is where I wrote the last Diary of Wimpy Kid book. I did a lot of my thinking right here, uh, looking out over the ocean. So sometimes being a children's author is is really pretty fun. So when I do come up with an idea, I know I have to write it down. If I don't write it down, it's just gonna be gone, right? So I have to write it down. In the old days, I wrote everything down in my sketchbook, but it was really risky. It was kind of dumb for me to do that because there was always that chance that I would lose that thing. And I could have lost four years, eight years worth of work if I just misplaced it. So I feel very lucky that I never did, but these days, I safeguard myself against that by writing everything down on gadgets, on devices. I write every, all my jokes down on iPads, iPhones, computers, right? Whatever I have in front of me. And it magically sends it up to the cloud, which whatever that is, right? And then if I break a computer, lose a device, I can just pick up another device and start where I left off. So that's really, really nice. Um, but something I think, in a way, has been lost, is that I like that sketchbook. You know, there's some magic to it. If you look at the pages of my sketchbook, you, you can feel them. And you can look through and look at all the ideas. You can't really do that with an iPad. So it's not as fun. I think some things have been lost in the digital age. So after I collect all my ideas, which takes me about six months, I start thinking about the cover. And so I had a few ideas for my new book. I knew it was going to be about a road trip. So here's one of my ideas where Greg is sort of splatted against the back window, right? Maybe his dad's driving, he accelerates, he hits the gas, and Greg goes flying. Kind of like that idea. I like this idea too, which was Greg in the way, way back of the minivan. Anybody who's ever been a kid on a road trip knows what this feels like, right? Yeah. And so if you look, there's, there's a little bit more story going on here because there's luggage in the car, so that tells you it's not a quick trip, it's a long trip. And also, you see that there's a flat tire, so that tells you a little bit more story, is that something's not going right with the road trip. So I like this image. The third idea I had was that Greg was sort of spilling out of the, of the back of his car, right, like a piece of luggage. So I like that idea as well. So I picked number two, and then I moved on to the color. And believe it or not, this takes a long time to find just the right shade. Here I was looking at colors for book eight. So I was thinking, should it be orange, should it be green? I eventually picked green for book eight. But for book nine, I knew it was going to be orange. So I looked through all sorts of paint samples to find just the right shade of orange. Once I had the cover image and the color, I had to come up with a title. And I came up with the title of The Long Haul because it suggests that you're on a long trip. You know, it's a journey. So I like that. I like that title very much. And then I put it all together, and at the end of it, I had a cover. So this is a misleading moment because it feels like, boy, I've got the cover of my book. It must be a real book already, right? But I haven't written a single word down, and it's time for me to get to work. The problem is now it's July, and in July, my kids are home from school, right? And they're having fun out in the cul-de-sac, and now, Right when I want to be having fun with them, I'm stuck inside with my dog, Thunder, right? Because we have a book to write. 
So, I'm not easily distracted when it comes time for writing, but sometimes it's just too tempting. I have to go out and join my kids on the swing set, right? <laughs> and I don't want to brag or anything, but I have looped the loop, right? I have done it. I have, no kids saw me, nobody was there to verify it, but uh, I did do it. It's impressive. How many other kids have looped the loop? Come on, be honest. A lot. What, a lo How many kids have trouble telling the truth a little bit? Right, okay. <laughs> so, here comes the boring part. <laughs> now to calm you down with the boring part of the speech. What I do next is I write the manuscript. I write the story. And this is the hardest part for me. It's just the words. It's not very fun, right? It's just the words. And so I, I spend a few weeks writing down the story. I send it off to my editor and I get it back and it looks kind of like this. And you'll see that the text, my book, is on the left-hand side. And on the right are all the corrections that my editor has made, right? And this is sort of like getting a paperback or a, you know, a, a, a quiz from your teacher. And the teacher has put red marks all over it, right? And you see all those red marks and it kind of deflates you. That's how I feel when I get this back. And it's especially frustrating, frustrating for me because now it's time for me to draw. Right? I need to draw. And so I do all my drawings on something called a Wacom tablet. It's like a giant iPad, a giant heavy iPad that tilts. Right? So I use a stylus, a plastic pen. And the reason I use a computer instead of pen and ink is because the computer allows me to zoom way in on my images. It allows me to really make them perfect by zooming way, way in. Now I'm going to show you what it looks like on my screen when I'm drawing something like Roderick's foot. Right? <laughs> So I zoom in at 2,000%, so really large, and so I'm really drawing with broad strokes, but that helps me as a cartoonist. I always start with the rough sketch, so I'm gonna show you a really complicated rough sketch that I did. So here there's a lot going on. We can see mom and dad are in the front of the minivan. Manny is in the back seat, and he's got this really weird pacifier in his mouth, right? It's got teeth in it. It's kind of like a practical joke pacifier for babies. And the reason I chose to do that is because I've made a few Wimpy Kid movies now, and it's really hard to get the mannies to act, right? It's hard to get a three-year-old to do what you want him to do. So I figured what we could do is stick a pacifier in his mouth, maybe put a ring pop at the end of it, and see if he behaves, right? So that was my idea for that, inspired by the movies. You see Roderick there looking grumpy. Greg's in the way back, and then something is asleep next to Greg. You'll see something... You guys have read the book. You guys have read the book. So I wanted to show you what it looks like. Oh, I wanted to show you what it looks like when I do uh, one of my drawings. So I'm going to hit play over there. Just one sec. So I do all of my illustrations in a program called Flash. And Flash is an animation program. In fact, a lot of your favorite cartoons are done in Flash. Cartoons on Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon, they're done in Flash. And you can see I'm drawing very, very slowly. I mentioned to you before, maybe more than once, that I'm not the best cartoonist. I couldn't cut it as a real cartoonist. So I do every, everything digitally because the computer is a tool for me. And you can see I make lots of mistakes. Like I drew Greg's nose and then I put it somewhere else. And now I'm drawing Greg's mouth, and I have to tweak it. I have to bend the lines to get just the right expression. And then I'm drawing Greg's head, which is hard for me. If you've ever tried to draw Greg Hefley's head, you'll notice a circle is actually really hard to draw. And his head looks lopsided, right? And that happens for me too. You'll see that I kind of missed the mark a little bit here. But then I can use a computer to fix it. Most cartoonists, modern cartoonists, what they would do is they'd use pencil and paper, pen and ink. They'd start with pencil, then they'd go over their pencil lines in ink, then they'd erase their pencil lines, so now they just have an ink drawing. They'd scan it into the computer and do little tiny touch-ups. Right? But I make corrections on the fly. I make collect corrections while I draw. So it really helps me, the computer. Even so, it takes me a long time to do a single drawing. This drawing probably took about an hour to, to finish. What I really like about cartooning is that it's the art of simplification. And you're trying to use as few lines as possible. I think the best cartoonists use as few lines as possible to tell their story. 
So I really like that about cartooning. And in fact, there was a cartoonist in the late 1800s whose editor challenged him to use half as many lines. And he said, if I use half as many lines, I'll have to charge you twice as much. I really like that idea that cartooning is the art of simplification. So let's, I'm not gonna make you sit here through a 45 minute drawing. I think this one took 45 minutes. I'm gonna go back and look at this drawing. So we talked about, you, I, I heard some of you guys say that there was a pig in the cooler. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit of his story. On the road trip, Manny wins a pig at a country fair, which is very inconvenient for the family. Uh, they have him in the minivan and they keep him in the cooler. And then one day, they get into kind of a traffic jam and dad hits the brakes and the pig flips out of the cooler, right, onto the floor. So now the pig's running around. It's this disaster scene. And eventually, he comes up for air and he's got Manny's pacifier, right? <laughs> and then Greg very, very, very carefully tries to pluck the pacifier out of the pig's mouth and he gets bit, all right? He gets, is it bitten? He gets, I'll say he gets bit, right? And so Greg ends up having to go, well, they're out in the middle of nowhere. There's, there are no doctors, there's no emergency rooms, anything like that. So they actually have to go to a veterinarian, right? An animal doctor for Greg. So Greg ends up in the waiting room behind a bird with a cold and a gerbil that ate a cigarette, right? <laughs> and a cat with a yogurt container on his mouth. So it's very humiliating for Greg. So these drawings, take me about a month to complete, but that's a little bit misleading because it takes, I have to draw for about 13 to 17 hours a day. So I have to eat in my lap, and, you know, I have to kind of just keep going and going and going. And unfortunately, I miss a lot of fun with my kids. And by the time I'm finished with my book, I, it's time for them to go back to school, right? And this is a picture of my very sad, you know, it's, it's a, sim it's a symbol of my kids going back to school. This is what it looks like for them when they have to leave summer behind. So for a little while, I forget all about my book. You know, I've been working on it for nine months. I need to get it out of my head. And then I'll get something in the mail. I'll open up an envelope. And inside is a book. And this is always a cool moment for me. Because up until this point, everything's been on the screen. It's been in my head or on the screen. And nothing's been real. And I think this is the magic of becoming a published author, is that you have ideas, and then it's made into something real, like a newspaper article, or a magazine article, or a book. You know, so this is a really cool moment for me. It's also really humbling, because I'm like, wow, I spent nine months on something that's really not that impressive. You know, it's not that big. It's not very heavy in my hands. Um, so the first thing I always do is I put it on my bookshelf, right? And I get to see it with the other books. And that's always a really rewarding moment because it always looks like it fits into the series. And the next thing is kind of fun. The next part of my life is kind of fun. I get to go out on the road and meet kids like you who are reading the book that I just finished writing. And so on the last book tour, we call it the Hard Luck Book Tour. We actually started in a giant bus in Las Vegas, right? And the bus is just as fun on the inside as it looks on the outside. That bus had, I think, six bunk beds. It had a shower, two lounges, nine televisions. It was crazy. It was crazy. So sometimes being a children's author is really, really fun. And right now, we're traveling around in a big orange bus, so I wanted to show you that one. <laughs> and you can see there's a lot of story going on here. We have Greg in the way, way back right? With all the luggage. And everybody up front has a lot more space, like the pig and Manny. Uh, Roderick's kind of rocking out there. Mom and dad look, well, mom looks happy. Dad doesn't. And we've got the seagulls that are a part of that story who are attacking a bag of cheese curls. And also I drew all of this grime and grit on the bottom of the bus. And the reason I did that was to give you a feeling that the bus has really traveled a great distance. In fact, Right now, we're the furthest south we go on our trip. We're in the Washington, D.C. area, of course, in Washington, D.C. And we go all the way up to Toronto. So we were going all over New England and just everywhere in this bus. So my journey as a children's author has taken me to crazy places. It's taken me all over the world. I've been to Europe several times. I've been to Brazil. I've been to Australia, where I spoke at the Sydney Opera House. 
um, which was really, really cool. And I've gotten to meet uh, celebrities. I've gotten to meet a lot of other authors, a lot of athletes, singers. And I've even got to meet, gotten to meet three U.S. presidents, including President Obama. Have you heard of him? Heard of him? Yeah? Okay. So this is actually a special picture for me. It's my dad, who I told you about, you know, who inspired me to become a cartoonist. My mom, who is an educator. The Obamas. And then there's myself and my wife and my two kids, who are actually in the room right over there, right today, visiting with me today. And then, oh yeah, give them, give them a big hand. These guys, are, these guys are funny, I gotta tell you. Um, I'll tell you some stories later on. But <laughs> my son's shaking his head, no. No, that's only the one from yesterday. From yesterday, okay, I'll tell you a quick story. Right, my, we were at Outback Steakhouse, which is supposed to be like Australian style food. And Will ordered his whole order. He was like a burger and fries and this and that and this and that. I said, Will, you have to order it um, like an Australian would. And Will goes, mate? <laughs> it was pretty good, I gotta say. I couldn't have written that one myself. Um, but I've gotten to do all these really cool things in the last seven or eight years, being an author. But I think the coolest thing I got to do was I got to create a balloon for the Macy's Day Parade, right? The Thanksgiving Parade, which you guys have seen, right? So I got to create a giant helium balloon. Cartoonists are always hiding messages in their work, and I hid one here. The colors I used were black, white, yellow, and red. And can anybody guess why I use that, those colors right here? They are the colors for Greg in the first book, but why would I have used those specific colors on the first book? Anybody guess? Where are we, what, what state are we near? Where did I grow up? Yeah? Uh, uh, <laughs> Maryland. Maryland. Maryland, that's right. I grew up in Maryland, and uh, so I actually uh, wanted to represent the Maryland state flag. But I wanted to end on this slide to remind you, you know, to inspire any kid in the audience um, who has a dream to really chase after it because you know I'm not the most talented cartoonist I'm not the most talented illustrator but I was I mean not the most talented writer but I was very very persistent I really did stick with this for a while so if you have a dream I hope you'll chase after it because maybe one day you'll be lucky like me and you'll get to see your idea fly so thank you guys so much for having me thank you Library of Congress and I think we have um, we're, we have time for some questions, so let's, uh, let's get those done. Okay, can I call? Okay, how about the girl in the green shirt right here? So why don't you stand up when I call you? And you know what? This, if everybody can be um, quiet enough, maybe we don't need the mics. You want to try it without? You want, I'll repeat the question, or should we do it? Let's go for it. Okay. That's a great question. How do I come up with my ideas and how do I remember the funny and silly things that happen? I wish that I had written them down when they happen because I had to spend all this time trying to, trying to remember everything. But if you're a kid, I, I would really recommend that you keep a journal or just at least write down the funny things because my stories are really ordinary. You know, there's nothing about them. Greg isn't magical. He's not fighting dragons or anything like that. Right? He's just a kid. And I think that, that other kids relate to those stories. So I'd really recommend that you collect those stories. Right in the side, right there, purplish jack, uh, shirt, stand up. Uh, what gave you the idea of writing that story? Like, what was the inspiration? What gave me the idea for writing it? I think it was the failure to become a cartoonist. I felt like I was born to be a cartoonist, and I needed to become a cartoonist. I just needed to figure out my own way. I think we could have the house lights on if you'd like if that's better. If it's okay uh, to keep them off, let's see. There's a kid with a, uh, um, yeah, stand up. You, you, yeah. Yes? What's it like being in a crazy bus all the time? What's it like being in a crazy bus all the time? That's a great question because I'm on that bus from the 3rd of November until the 25th. It's a long time. You start to, you start to miss home a little bit. And how about the other guy that almost got called on? Go ahead, bud. 
the the ninth book is definitely my favorite book um, because I think it's the best written. I've, I never have considered myself a really strong narrative writer. I don't worry too much about the story. I'm worried about the jokes, right? And in this book, I really did worry about the narrative because I was thinking about movies. I was thinking about making it into a movie. So I wanted the narrative to be really strong. The white shirt right here. Oh, we have a couple of white shirt kids. Let's get this guy who stood up. What, what other two? This is going to get political. We're in a political town, right? It was uh, George W. Bush and George H. W. Bush, his father. Yeah. So, uh, how about the green shirt right there? Yeah? How long have I been writing books? For, I guess it's been about 16 years since I started. So, right here with the glasses on? Yeah? Oh, yes. And then we'll get you. Well, I get a chance to sign your books. I'm not sure how we're working that. I'm going to leave that to the grown-ups. So we're going to figure that out afterwards. So there was this guy right here with the glasses. I, I think it's available here. <laughs> right, so yes, the answer is yes to that. So in the aisle right there with the, uh, the little girl with the uh, sundress on? Yes. That's you. Stand up. Yeah. What inspired me to an author? I think it was just not becoming a cartoonist, a newspaper cartoonist, the way I planned. So a guy with an eagle on his shirt, with a red shirt on. Yeah, I feel like every kid has been on some kind of road trip. Even if it's just like two or three hours in the car, it can be really awful. Right, guys? <laughs> yeah. So... And we did, last night, we did 10 hours in a bus to get down here. There's a guy standing up already, straight and true. How about it? That's a great question. Okay, so in Cabin Fever, Bryce Anderson, he opens a restaurant. Like all these kids get together and they, they make a restaurant for the parents and they make a lot of money. I had a friend named Drew Weaver who was always doing stuff like that. Whenever he needed money, he'd put together a fun fair or do a restaurant in his backyard. And I was always impressed by him, you know, and I, I think he's gone really far in life. Okay, so there's a guy with a red shirt almost against the wall. Yep, stand up. Oh, okay. My favorite comic when I was a kid, I would have to say was Peanuts. You know, I just always read it. I just always read it. I, I don't know why that Peanuts, right? That's not funny, right? Okay, yes? Uh, what's going to be my next book? I know it's going to be book 10. And I don't have any ideas yet, and I need to work. I need to get start working on that soon. So we're going to take about two more questions. I'm sorry that I'm not going to get to everybody. Okay, there's a guy with a white shirt with a hat on, yes, or headband, something. I'll tell you one of the stories that happens in the long haul that happened in the real life. All right, my mom, all right, you, just, you have to wait for this one because it's a good story, is that we had a pet rabbit named Frisky, right? And I was in the front seat, and I was actually a baby, and I was getting changed, I'm embarrassed to say, right? And my mother was changing me in the front seat, and the pet rabbit got out in the very back of the, mini, of the station wagon. It got out of the car, and then it was trying to get out of the back window, like crawl out of the back. We were going over a bridge, like the Delaware Memorial Bridge, I think it was. And he was like halfway out. And so my mother like abandoned me and dove over the seats and grabbed the, the bunny rabbit by its back legs. And so that was one of the ideas that served as a big scene in the new book. So is it anybody's birthday today? I'm going to go. All right, we'll go with yesterday, guys. All right, we're going to go with Mr. Yesterday.
Red, red jacket, let's go for it. Your birthday is... <laughs> Stand up, bud. All right, this better be a good question. Let's go for it. Have I written any other book series? No, but I'm really thinking about it. I'm going to write a book series, I think, about a girl who manages a sports team of boy basketball players. I think that would be a lot of fun. Right. All right, guys. Thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, guys, let's listen. Thank you to the Library of Congress. Can take a photo real quick? I was going to say. Thank you to the Library of Congress. This is a huge, huge honor for me. Thank you. And now we're going to all stay really, really calm because we're going to try to take a group photo, which we can only pull off. We can only pull it off if we're like literally just like really cool. All right? We can do this. Be cool. Okay, here we go. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Now, where do I go? We're right behind the projector, right into the fray. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.